Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to this meeting on the 6th of August 2024. I'd like to welcome committee members, members of the public and those watching at home. I'd also like to remind everyone in this room that the meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube later on. First item on the agenda, we've got to apologies, and I've got apologies so far from Councillor Adams, Councillor Coates and Councillor Claymore. Are there any more apologies before we move on? No. Second item, minutes from the last meeting. The minutes of the previous meeting held on the 2nd of July 2024 are here for approval. Can I request a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Smith and Councillor Turner. Thank you. Item number three, declarations of interest. Before there are any made, I would like to read out the following statement. I confirm that under section 33.2 of the Localism Act 2011, the Act permits an authority to grant a dispensation from either or both of the restrictions not to participate and or vote on a matter in which they have a pecuniary interest. Planning Committee members have received a further dispensation for applications relating to the future High Street project for a period of two years, starting from the 5th of August 2024 until the 5th of August 2026. Having said that, are there any declarations of interest? Councillor Kingston, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, it's the final application 0367 slash 2023, um, South Staffs College, to declare an interest, as I've already expressed an opinion several times publicly about the whole application. Thank you, Councillor Kingston. Are there any more other declarations before we move on? Nope. Okay, then. Item 4A, applications for consideration. Update information on application 0113 2024 12 to 13 Market Street. I'd like to hand over to Debbie Hall to present the report, please. Sorry, no, for this one, I'm, I'll, I'll do this one. <laughs> so this one is the uh, update to an application that we received, uh, well, sorry, went to committee uh, last month for the new shopfront at 12 to 13 Market Street. The applicant wishes to make just a slight change to the glazing arrangement. Um, part of the slides up here just to show what was approved originally and how they want to change that design. In effect, they're going from the multiple glaze units at the top there to a more simplified glazing style at the bottom. So if members uh, are minded just to approve that slight variation, uh, that would um, replace the condition of plans that were originally put on the application back in July. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Are there any questions? Would anyone like to discuss this item? Councillor Clark. Thank you. Um, a small query, please. The six fan lights that were reduced to three fan lights, is there any enlargement in the size of the three fan lights? I wasn't quite sure. Only what's referenced on the plan. So as you can see here, you've got basically six. So yeah, it's going down to yeah three across that top and then four instead of the six on that side. Anyone else before we move on? Councillor Turner. Thank you, Chair. Just, just a co uh, comment, really, and a point of clarity. Have uh, Nationwide now signed off for the building for the future High Street Fund and took ownership of? It is not directly relevant to the application, but yes, they have. Anyone else before we move on? Councillor Clark. Can I make a comment with my history hat on, please, sir? <laughs> Thank you. Um, certainly, and then with the previous hat on, I have copies of many of the pictures of what the cafe used to look like. Um, I certainly confirm that the roof is well done, extremely well done. I was concerned about that because I did feel the way that it was the place was flattened originally, I was not a happy bunny. But I believe that they have been in contact with the right people to get the right items in place. Um, I certainly approve of what they've done to date. Thank you. Any more comments before we move on? No? In that case then, I would like to read out the recommendation which is grant planning planning permission based on revised plans for the proposal submitted post the original recommendations to approve can I ask for a mover and a seconder please councillor smith can i have a seconder please councillor clark 
All those in favour? One, two, three, four, five. It's unanimous. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unanimous, thank you very much. Moving on to the second application, which is 0134, 2024, 12 to 13 Market Street. I think I'm handing over to Debbie for this one. Yep, if you'd like. Thank you, Jay. Yes, it is me now. <coughs> Excuse me. Evening, councillors. Uh, my name is Debbie Hall, and I'm presenting the advertisement consent application for 12 to 13 Market Street, reference 0134, uh, 2024. <coughs> this application is for the installation of various externally illuminated and non-illuminated signage to the shop front that has been presented to you uh, by Glenn. The proposal relates to a fascia sign across the full width of the front elevation above the ground floor, a hanging sign to the right of the fascia sign, and uh, instructional and directional signs around the ATM and around the entrance, and also a frosted dotted line on the doors, which is a, a safety feature. Uh, the fascia sign and the hanging sign would be externally illuminated with trough lighting. The key poli policies relevant to this application are EN5, design and new development, and EN6, protecting the historic environment. The NPPF also has a chapter 16, conserving and enhancing the historic environment, and paragraph 141, which specifically um, relates to adverts. The site is a listed building in the town centre conservation area. MPPF paragraph 141 states that advertisements should be subject to control only in the interests of amenity and public safety. The planning practice guidance defines amenity as the effect on visual amenity in the immediate neighbourhood of an advertisement goes on to say that we must consider the local characteristics of the neighbourhood and whether it is in scale and in keeping with these features. When this uh, application was originally submitted to us, it actually featured internal illumination. Um, <clears throat> however, this was judged to be uh, not in keeping with the setting given the conservation area status. Um, so amended details were submitted at the request of the local planning authority showing the trough external lighting, which is considered to be more in keeping with the heritage setting. The proposed signs are considered to comply with policy EN6 and Chapter 16 of the MPPF. The, si the signs are considered to be appropriate in number, scale and design for the use of the building as a bank and comply with policy EN5 and paragraph 141 of the MPPF. Conservation officer has been consulted on the proposed signs and has raised no objections. The site is on a pedestrianised street and therefore there is uh, unlikely to be any issues with glare causing distraction to drivers and the level of illumination complies with the standing advice provided by County Highways. For these reasons, the application is recommended for approval subject to three conditions. Uh, the condition is that the development has to start within five years. Uh, condition two is compliance with the plans, and condition three is a standard advert condition that we um, we put on all adverts, and it it's, makes reference to ownership and safety and, and general maintenance of the, of the advert. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Debbie. Are there any questions? <laughs> no? Would anyone like to... Sorry, Councillor Clark. Um, am I right in thinking that the um, the ad advert, uh, the advertising items, will be reassessed in five years to make sure they're still in line, design was the N five. Yeah, all all advert uh, advert concerns only last five years, and then they have to reapply in five years' time. Yeah. Any more questions before we move on to discussion? Nope. Would anyone like to make any comments or? 
in that case then. The recommendation, as Debbie said, is that the committee approves subjects to the conditions that were read out. Can I look for a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Smith and Councillor Clark. And all those in favour? Any against? Any abstentions? No. Nope. Okay. I'd like to move on then to item 4C, <coughs> which is application 0163-2023, land <coughs> at Tamworth Road, Dostal. I'd like to hand over to Glenn Baker Adams to present his report, please. Thank you, Chair. So this application uh, is a bit different in the fact that the application cross boundaries with our neighbours in North Warwickshire. The application is a predominantly industrial uh, scheme. Um, I will also mention that in part of the report, there is a statement which we really I mentioned that we, we give an update in terms of the decision that the North Warwickshire Council took yesterday. The application was deferred by their council members, so they still wanted some additional information submitting regards to tree retention, some clarification around hours of use, and also around the uses of the actual buildings themselves. Notwithstanding that recommendation by uh, North Warwickshire, it's still the view of the council that the application within the boundary within Tamworth uh, is acceptable. It provides an ecological area or an area of, to be left for ecological purposes. The area of green to the north of the site indicated on this plan actually indicates that fact that no development will take place in that area within the Tamworth boundary. It is purely for ecological management purposes only. I've additionally included this slide here, obviously it's a bit wordy, but in effect it provides the condition that will apply to the development in North Warwickshire requiring the statement for sorry an ecological management plan to be provided by the applicants this will have to do a number of things uh, this is not the complete list there's also another page here showing exactly what needs to be provided on that plan to obviously make sure that ecological assets are maintained on site so in terms of the, the area within tamworth it was i say will be managed for ecological purposes and that is it so members are you know minded that any decision has to be consideration with these various issues on ecology and that is the only consideration for us because as I say that is the only development within our patch so to speak um, but that, that's the site as a whole um, members as they were invited to um, recommend approval uh, last night but they did have some of the qualifications which will hopefully be ironed out before their next meeting in September by which time I will update members of this council that that decision hopefully will be approved and uh, we do actually have the applicant here to speak so I'll invite them when are you ready? Thank you very much, Glenn. And as Glenn indicated there, I'd like to invite Mr. Henry Courtier to have three minutes to put his case forward. Thank you. Good evening, councillors. My name is Henry Courtier, planning consultant on this project. I'm here with Stuart Black, development director at Sumex, the applicant and owners of the site. We're both happy to answer any questions you may have. This application seeks 22,000 square metres of floor space to meet modern day needs for uses within light industrial, research and development, general industrial and storage and distribution. All built form is to be located within the administrative boundary of North Warwickshire, with the land within Tamworth boundary solely to be used for green infrastructure purposes, including drainage, landscaping and biodiversity enhancements. Last night, North Warwickshire deter determined to defer the application to explore possibilities with the applicant of ways to further reduce the impacts of the development upon nearby residential properties. This includes consideration of additional tree planting and landscape buffer buffering within North Warwickshire's demise, as well as the split of uses across the site. These will be considered by the applicant and will revert back to North Warwickshire's planning committee at earliest opportunity. None of these amendments would materially affect the land within Tamworth's demise, which is to remain as green infrastructure to serve the wider development. And therefore, it's our view that Tamworth can continue to consider this application tonight. Although currently unmanaged, this part of the site within Tamworth's demise is designated as a site of county biological importance. To this end, in accordance with adopted policy EN4, we are seeking to enhance the area of the site through adoption of a landscape and ecology management plan, which will actively manage and enhance biodiversity features, thus providing a betterment of the existing situation. This management plan is to be secured by planning condition and will include a 30-year reporting procedure to capture biodiversity net gain. 
It's important to note the site already benefits from extant planning permission dating back to 1997 for employment and industrial uses. This permission remains extant with the creation of the site access and therefore is a significant material consideration in the determination of this application as it is a legitimate fallback position which could be built out at any point. However, this extant permission does not include any landscape or ecology enhancement measures which are provided under this current application. The development proposal will make a significant contribution to the local economy anticipated to deliver between 150 and 300 jobs dependent upon the mix of uses to be determined at reserve matter stage. As such, the proposal will deliver numerous economic, social and environmental benefits in accordance with the NPPF and it is respectfully requested that members support the officer's recommendation to approve this planning application. Thank you. Thank you very much Mr Courtier. Are there any questions? And may I suggest that if you would like to speak to the agent, then obviously indicate that you're going to speak. Otherwise, direct your questions to the officers, please. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Coal Authority, have they been approached at all? Um, no mining risk assessment? Is there a need for this in your opinion? Please. Um, the, there wasn't a coal mining risk assessment submitted with the application. Uh, obviously the council, both, both North Warwickshire and Tamworth, have both undertaken their own statutory consultation on the application. And we haven't got any, uh, any objections to the current application from, from any statutory authorities, as far as I'm aware. Any question? Any more questions? If that's the case, then we'll move to discussion. If anyone likes to make any comments on the application, I'm presuming Councillor Foster. Yeah, I'd welcome the fact that you know we're trying to increase the biodiversity, and as I'm new to sort of planning, um, I think it's a key area that we need to consider for planning applications in the future to actually make sure that biodiversity I know we haven't got a lot of ground or whatever but it is it is something that um, you know we're working alongside Staffordshire County Council to try and increase our biodiversity so I welcome the fact that this at least although it's only a small piece of land at least it is going to be considered and biodiversity within our within our boundaries is going to be increased which I you know I, I applaud Thank you. Are there any other comments on this particular application? <coughs> no. If that's the case then, the recommendation is that we, the committee approve subject to the conditions out, laid out in the report. I would like to ask for a mover and a seconder please. Councillor Smith and a seconder please. Councillor Foster. All those in favour? Any against? Any abstentions? Councillor Smith. Yeah. Smith, thank you. That is carried, I presume? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right then. <coughs> we shall move on now to 4D, application 0367 2023, South Staffs College, Cross Street, Tamworth. I'd like to invite, once again, Glenn Baker Adams to present his report. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. So as per the report, this application... Oh, sorry. For this part of the meeting, Councillor Kingston won't be taking part in this process. OK, so yeah, this application is, um, I said, a deferred item. Back in on the 5th of June, uh, we discussed the application before us for the demolition of the college buildings. To make way for eventual development of the site, um, the application is currently undergoing consideration. Um, a few issues still to be ironed out for that one to be determined at committee yet, but um, this is where we are with the demolition application. Just as a reminder, the application for demolition is required by the applicants to secure procurement for eventual contractors to carry out that demolition work in the future. Members at the time of the decision of the application in June were very con well concerned about the impacts on the highway safety. So as a result, the applicant was requested to look at this in more detail. 
We also asked our colleagues at Staffordshire County Council Highways Department to provide a bit more information in terms of their response to the application. Working with Staffordshire County Highways, I'm thankful to receive an additional Form X or a consultation response from them. That is a part of the appendices to the application. I don't know if you received that uh, this, this afternoon, but that details in a bit more detail in terms of what uh, consideration officers have give, given to highway safety. And as well as that as well, an additional a condition has been included for a construction management plan that will need to be submitted before the actual works are uh, taking place. So to again give a bit more considerations to highway movements when that actually does take place in terms of contractor vehicles moving to and from the site with the uh, material to obviously to demolish the uh, buildings themselves. Another reminder in terms of how the highway movements would work, that's the site there showing that how the, um, yeah, the movements will take place. And then this slide again shows the areas of where the demolition will um, take place, the actual blue hatch markings, and then the circle at the, the site will be where a stockpile of material will be left for the eventual construction construction of the um, of the buildings that might take place on site. Fortunately, as well today we have uh, Mark Evans who's joined us um, to have any to, to have a discussion in terms of his involvement in the site and any considerations to highways that members still might have. Mark is here to answer any questions as well. But as before, application is recommended for approval. And um, yeah, I think that's all I can say for this one. Thank you. Thank you for that, Glenn. I'd like to invite Brendan Dale to speak in favour of this application. You have three minutes. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak again in favour of this application tonight. Um, I'd like to address the concerns that were raised previously regarding uh, construction traffic management and proximity to the railway line uh, and emphasise why we think this application deserves your support tonight. Um, Homes England understand the importance of minimising the impact on residents as much as possible and ensuring a safe demolition takes place. Um, to that end, the application was originally submitted with a demolition works plan, which includes measures to suppress dust, limit working hours on the site, uh, prevent the spillage of materials and ensure residents have a dedicated point of contact for the duration. The additional information provided by Staffordshire County Council since the last committee demonstrates the careful consideration with which they scrutinise the application um, and the proposals from a highway suspect, uh, perspective and in particular shows how Homes England were required to address queries and provide further information post the submission of the application. The proposals have demonstrated that safe access can be provided for the works and that several measures will be in place both prior to and during. Um, this includes the contractor will be provide, uh, required to provide detailed method statements and risk assessments, um, designated routes for vehicles to enter and exit the site, uh, and a limit on the number of vehicles operating during peak hours. Since the last committee, as Glenn mentioned, an additional planning uh, condition has been agreed, which would require Homes England to submit a traffic management plan uh, to be approved in writing by the local planning authority prior to commencement. Uh, it should also be noted that uh, as required in the national rail response, um, Homes England have been engaging with them directly as a key stakeholder on this site um, and we'll have to agree the works details with them prior to them taking place as well. Um, we're also keen to work with local councillors to pick up any concerns as they come forward. Um, since the last committee, we did reach out to some members offering a site visit with residents, um, but this offer remains open for all councillors on this committee if there is future interest. Um, so in summary, we welcome the opportunity to keep working with all the stakeholders mentioned um, to ensure that once the college buildings do become vacant, uh, the demolition can take place in a safe and timely manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Dale. If you'd like to stay around for questions, if you're comfortable for that, yeah, just in case, thank you. Right, I'll move on to questions then. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> I do have some questions. So the first one is, uh, in your report, report, specifically in the introduction at 1.4, it mentions, quote, since this meeting, Staffordshire County Council have provided additional information on the consultation response. This can be found at Appendix A, which you've mentioned. So why is the date of the letter from Staffordshire County Council dated February and prior to June's committee meeting? That I can't explain. Um, all I do know is it's definitely different to the one I received originally. So I guess they've just not changed the date, but there's definitely a response I received subsequent to the, the committee of June the 5th. Okay. So, Councillor, if I can just second your answer to that. Um, 
admin error is a simple answer. Um, we always blame the computer system, but there's always somebody that presses the button. When we generate a secondary reply, our computer system generates a blank document, but there's certain fields within that document stays the same as version one, e.g. the address, the application details, and that date is fixed, we have to change it, and obviously the officers forgot to change the date. But a secondary reply has been given. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Sounds familiar to something else that I've been dealt with over the last year or so in regards to let dates on letters, but anyway. Um, so I get what you're saying, but was this letter sent slash available to TBC prior to June's planning committee meeting? Would you like to pick up? Yeah, no, yes, so the response form X, yeah, was given, as I say, and then uploaded to said website for view before the meeting. So if this was, if this letter was available to TBC prior to June's planning committee, why was it not included in the agenda appendix for that particular meeting, which would have added value to the debate and had the potential to meet SU1 and SU2 of the local plan. No, forgive me, sorry for the confusion. The first uh, consultation response was given. That was uh, given before the 5th of June meeting. When that was viewed, that was obviously considered inaccept you know, unacceptable. But subsequently to that, on the 10th of July, I received a new one, and that one has the more information that we now believe to be sufficient to, you know, tip this matter off, so to speak. Councillor Smith. So just to confirm and, and possibly just to rephrase this, the contents of that letter in Appendix A, were you aware or not aware of that before June's committee? No, this is different. This adds a bit more detail. It adds a bit more meat on the bones in terms of the considerations the highways officer has made. And they said the additional condition, that's also included in this updated Form X or consultation response. Yeah, it's just, it's just a bit surprising, really, because, you know, I, I see what you're saying about the dates and the mechanisms and processes around how that was established. It's just confusing. It's just strange that in the process of uploading it and adding it to the agenda, the date on that wasn't noticed as being an incorrect date. And I think in these times that we, you know, expect, um, you know, a good level of due diligence, really, I'm surprised that wasn't noticed. Um, so... I'll let somebody else come in if they want to. I've got some more questions, if that's OK. Are there any other questions? Councillor Turner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, it's regarding the capacity planning down uh, Gungate, and Upper Gungate in particular. Uh, as you n noticed on our last meeting, we were concerned about the exit on and off of Croft Street with these... Um, you know, 40 vehicles a day or, or, or whatever. Um, my question is, and I've tried to look on the uh, planning portal, so I'd like some clarification. The original plan for the capacity planning was actually in 2018 of that road. Has that been updated since? So I'm just surprised looking at the consultation response. Um, as part of this application, um, we have comments about personal injury conditions, the background, um, so just an assessment of what the area locally is like, so speed limits, etc. How the proposal is described, and the comment on the application is purely about the site-specific issues. So again, how traffic will be managed within the site in terms of wider impacts. That's not for assessment of um, highways officers, as they obviously considered to be, yeah, a, an issue relevant to what's within the site and nothing, nothing external. Um, demolition, uh, yeah, and again, there is an assessment on parking numbers um, in terms of making sure that we provided for all staff and visitors and visitors. Demolition of carnage would have heavy vehicles on the road, but as per the above, there are few in number, one to two per day, and would not have a severe impact on Croft Street or the local highway network. So, yeah, just a general assessment of the yeah the local comings and goings of vehicles within that local area. Second Councillor Turner, Mark would like to jump in on this. Yeah, thank you. We're not avoiding the question. What is in front of you tonight 
forgive the bluntness, is a demolition management plan. And all of the associated traffic associated with that works. We are not looking at two, three hundred houses as a replacement for the college. That is not in front of us tonight. All you can make a decision on, and all we looked at when we determined the application, is how much traffic does the demolition of those buildings generate, and does that cause a highway safety issue on the network? Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I understand that fully. Uh, and that's hence where I'm leading to, that if the original assessment of Gungate was done in 2018, since then, there has been a, a, at least a 1,000 houses built at the top end of Gungate at Ashby Road. Now, I know you're shaking your head because of the, uh, the confusion. I'm just looking at the holistically picture of the 40 trucks a day or the you've, you've got down that vehicles will be moving from um, 8 in the morning to late at night, Monday to Friday, and 8 till th 1 o'clock on a Saturday. Um, and these are big, heavy vehicles that are going to be joining... Um, upper Gungate during their hours for the de demolition. So these are interlinked and therefore we need to look at this carefully. I understand you're trying to narrow it down, but that's not right that we're narrowing it down and we're saying there is no more extra traffic that at Gungate in the last four or five years. So I'd like your thoughts on that, please. I've got Anna first. Uh, I, I, I fully get the point that you're making and I think if this was the application which will come to committee in the very near future for the housing that's going to replace it potentially I, I think that's a very valid kind of um, sort of questioning to and route to go down but as Glenn has just said from the consultation response uh, the county highways have responded to we're talking about one or two demolition trucks a day and, and, and that's it and that is not considered to be significant a significant impact on the network um, and it has to be significant and um, that's a sort of a, a threshold within planning that's important in decision making so we're talking about one or two vehicles additional a day um, and, and that's it thank you before I let you jump in Councillor Smith I've got Mark to respond as well thank you um, just to clarify the position in terms of the 1,000 houses at the top of Ashby Road, it was a Litchfield District Council plan application. I was there myself, um, still dealing with that site personally. It has consent to build up to 1,000, but it has a monitor and manage planning condition imposed by the planning inspectorate, whereby they have triggers of two, 300 and 500 homes they do not have <coughs> permission yet in terms of those triggers to build a thousand so the capacity assessments done for that corridor showed they could based on monitor and manage that was done by the planning inspectorate we have our own traffic models that we still use for the corridor and obviously i'm going to go off piece but to draw on what uh, anna has just said is what you have to consider in the bigger picture is the college generates traffic as a site fully operational generates traffic it will generate a hell of a lot less when it's being demolished granted there will be larger vehicles but there will be a lot less vehicles because it won't be open and there won't be cars using it so in terms of this application the corridor will have less vehicles on it because the college won't be operational so what the college does generate will be significantly less therefore the corridor will have less on it thank you would you like to come back councillor yeah thanks yeah thank, I, I fully understand that that during that short period of demolition instead of for example you know 600 people going to college every day you're just going to have as you, as in your word 40 eight wheel wheel trucks moving around so i do, I do, I do get that um however you know, we're looking at the bigger picture here, and it should be, and I, I appreciate your, your, your comments, uh, to be honest. They're, they're right. You know, we look at the bigger picture. Since that application went in in 2018, things have changed. There are a lot more houses up there, and if you travel that road school time, particularly, uh, uh, you know, early morning and late at night, even without the college open, it's very busy. 
and I'm just thinking of one of the concerns that I read, read in there that the application said for the college that the new homes 60% of the applicant or the, the, the residents would walk to work and I was, read that and I thought that's a bit random anyway I, I, I move on I hear what you're saying so I, I know Councillor Smith wants to have a word I think, uh, sorry, I've just been quietly listening to uh, the, various, the various comments made and just sort of carrying on from what Mark and Hannah have also said, I think it's important to remember, you know, these are arguments when we have the full application, the full housing application before committee, but the proposal which is uh, before committee today is demolition of the existing buildings and that's all you're there to consider and I've got to remind you of that. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. I hear what you're saying. You're probably getting frustrated because you're thinking, goodness gracious, we're just on the demolition part. We're not even uh, you're talking about the, uh, the, the further application. Um, but, you know, we're trying to reduce the potential misery of the residents of the surrounding area of the six months, potentially, that could be um, massively uh, disrupted. So, you know, I take your points, and I take Mark, Mark's point about the... Uh, the college, uh, I would say, of course, that uh, you know most of those that are attending there probably aren't driving um, and making their way via alternative means. Um, I have got a question. I just want to mention, just follow on. <laughs> just wanted to make a side statement on that one. Um, in the June planning committee, the application was deferred to allow for a compilation of additional information. It should be noted that in our previous session, a motion was passed then withdrawn after hearing legal advice. However, this motion encompassed apprehensions regarding the potential effects on the nearby railway. In keeping with the respect expected from officers to committee members, it's pertinent to question why this supplementary report fails to reflect the concerns about the adjacent railway that were articulated in the meeting and moreover were acknowledged in the minutes that have previously been approved. I think just to reiterate, I think I said it at the last committee in June, but there was no statutory objection and, the, and they were a statutory consultee on the application. Um, and as we've heard today in the three minutes that um, the applicant has had to speak, they are working closely with the railway authority who need to see plans before agreeing to them. So there is a dialogue there to address any working arrangements around being in close proximity to the railway. So there's, there are no concerns from a planning perspective um, in terms of this demolition application on that particular infrastructure. I, I don't think there was anything in the minutes about the railway line being the deferral reason. I thought it was just the highways. Councillor Smith, if you like. Sorry, can I just follow up? Um, it was, I don't want to be rude, but to be frank, it's the arrogance of the fact that it was thoroughly discussed in June's committee meeting. And the fact it wasn't even mentioned, the word railway is not even mentioned in the supplementary report that's uh, with us today, I think is um, slightly rude, really, to, to members of this committee. I think it should have been mentioned, at least some talking points on it, and further discussion. Um, so that's just my little little moan on the railways. Before I bring you in, Councillor Smith, uh, does anyone want to respond? Or? No? Okay. Just looking at it. Okay. Councillor Lewis Smith, please. Just to reiterate one of the points there, um, there was no objections by Network Rail. That, that is correct, yes? No objections at all? No? Okay. So, um, and also just to um, highlight something. So we keep saying about how there's going to be 40 heavy vehicles coming in every day. It says here, um, and I'll read it out. So total of 40 times eight wheeler wagon movements to remove scrap metal, timber, etc., <clears throat> over the time period. So that doesn't mean there's going to be 40 per day. There'll be one to two per day. And that 40 is the total to remove all the debris from the buildings out of the site. So it's 40 in total, but one to two per day. So if anyone wants to correct me if I'm wrong. 
That's hard. Yep. Um, the only other thing in terms of vehicle movements is obviously they will need to get larger vehicles in and a crushing machine, for example, on the back of a low loader to start the process. So um, I've got details here, which was forwarded on to Glenn. Um, we've got three articulated low loaders to bring that equipment in, which will sit there for the duration whilst they take the site apart. Then that equipment will leave at the end of the process. So that's the only additional <coughs> HGVs. And obviously anything that can't be recycled or reused on site will be taken off in a HGV. But yes, you're right. There is an initial small batch of HGVs to bring the kit in that will be used to demolish. Anything that cannot be recycled on site will be taken away in low loaders. And as I say, that could be very sporadic. It doesn't have to be all in one go. It just depends on what they demolish when and when it's got to leave site. Yeah. I'll bring you in, Councillor Clark and um, Anna. Just to say, we've just checked the minutes from the June committee where this was originally discussed. And we did discuss railways during that committee meeting because I remember contributing to that discussion. But it, it didn't form part of the deferral. That was the deferral refers only to highways matters. And it was for more um, information. The Form X was lacking, you felt. And there wasn't enough transparency in it to understand why the County Council had no objection. So that's why we've gone back and we've had an amended and revised Form X to provide that transparency and that clarity on the information submitted with the application. So nothing specific on railways, which is why it is not referred to in the supplementary report. Thank you. And I've got Councillor Clark first, please. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've always been told there was no precedent in planning and that's firmly stuck in my brain. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone who's given the information in today and councillors who have raised every point possible under the mattress of this particular application. I understand that today we can discuss only the demolition of the site at the moment containing the old college. We have no place on this committee to discuss or look beyond the demolition of this site. We have no opportunity this evening to discuss anything that will or may or may not happen in the future. Am I correct in that, officers? Because if I am, I can have no objection subject to the following items, one, two and three, being enacted. Please correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's correct. Okay. Councillor Sam Smith, please. I was just going to come back slightly on what you said there um, about the minutes. Um, the minutes has mentioned, I know there was no legal requirement to follow up on it. I'm just mentioning that the minutes do, do express a couple of points that were raised during the meeting. And clearly at one particular point, we did raise a motion due to those points and the impact on the local plan. And of course, we can, we can unpack that. But there was a couple of points that were raised and they were around the demolition and the debris near the railway line and the concerns to the demolition, uh, concerns to the damage to the highways. And of course, we respected the fact that the legal advice at the time told us there would be a potential problem further down the road. And of course, we reflected on that and we moved away. But from just a, a to you know a moral standpoint, considering these issues were raised in quite in grave intensity, and due to the fact that the impact on, on residents' lives, and due to the fact of the safety of the nearby network, railway network, I just would have hoped that actually those points would have been further mentioned in the supplementary report. So I just wanted to say that. I have got a question, if that's okay, Chair. Um, in the last report, TBC's recommendation was to quote, was to quote, grant planning permission subject to conditions listed in section eight of this report. Why is this no longer referenced in this report? 
purely because we're just dealing with this one significant matter of deferral. So this is purely on the highway safety aspects of the deferral that we were discussed that we discussed previously, um, and then we've obviously added on a new condition for the purpose of, of this uh, relating to the construction management plan. So that will be added to the list of conditions that we already have for the application. Would you like to come back, Councillor? Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't really sort of make sense in a way because you're basically saying on the first report that you want to grant permission, and then you're saying on the supplementary report, so you've already got a duplication. You would have just thought that you would in, in, allude back to the previous committee um, about the fact that there are these stipulations, because if you're asking us to um, uh, vote on this and agree to uh, this uh, planning application you know what are we to think about those conditions which by the way are considerable if you list if you look at the previous report there's a long list uh, there and they are incredibly important so i would just say that the last committee meeting the last report we did not agree on we did not vote and thus it falls to this one to now agree to it and vote on it but it doesn't include those conditions it just seems a bit strange that's all As the officers have said, that's not for discussion. We only came back for the deferral reasons, Councillor Smith. Um, are there any more questions for officers on this application? Councillor Smith. I've got a couple of recommendations, and, I'll, and I'd look for a seconder. Um, and if, I, if you can uh, entertain me for just a moment. Um, the first one is, I have been on the website, um, crash uh, map.co.uk and I understand the report alludes to Cross, Cross Street but there are of course a number of um, uh, incidents should we say along the A513 Upper Gun Gate and the immediate area okay so there are concerns there in terms of the safety aspect so it follows me on to just um, ask for a couple of recommendations looking for a seconder the first one would be to recommend to Staffordshire County Council and all highways England that, that sections of road should include 20 mile hour speed limit restrictions, um, specifically on Croft Street, the one-way system and on the A513 Upper Gun Gate, specific to where the heavy, heavy wagons will be travelling from the lower junction aligned with Albert Street and Hospital Street up to the end of the A513. That also moves me into the second re recommendation, which is the conclusion of this report, specifically 8.2, states traffic management plan shall be submitted to and improved by, to be approved by the local planning authority. As such, and we haven't seen that plan yet, as such, I would recommend the traffic management plan should be brought to the earliest planning committee for review and feedback by members. I'll look for a seconder. That's before we move for a seconder. Mark, do you have any comments on speed uh, Thank you, Councillor. In terms of the 20 mile an hour on Cross Street, in my personal opinion, they probably won't get to 20 mile an hour down there given how heavy they're going to be on exiting with a pile of rubbish in the back. Yeah, I know. In terms of Cross Street, what it is, the A513 is a primary route network. It's a strategic network to move traffic around the country. That's what it is. To put a temporary 20 mile an hour on, you will have to advertise a road traffic order. I bet my mortgage you'll never get it not on an A road. So I would not recommend that because I don't think it's achievable and I don't think it's safe because I don't think drivers will abide by it given what it is.
Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, I, I highly doubt you'd be able to get an order to reduce the speed limit. And at the end of the day, the decision by us is highway safety. Now, I understand the reason for asking it because you believe there is a highway safety issue. We don't believe there is, and one or two HGVs a day is not going to generate a safety issue, in our opinion. Now, the one thing you could consider, and this is where the traffic management plan comes in, for example, is if you have concerns of a HGV turning right out of Croft Street to go north, then the traffic management plan and a recommendation could come from yourself tonight, I'm not wishing to put words in your mouth, but if this is the discussion you're having, is you could say that only left out of Cross Street for HGV, because that's an easy manoeuvre to make for a HGV. It doesn't have to try and turn right and head north out of the Gungate Corridor. I don't think, as I say, I don't think it would be um, supported by us as a highway authority, by the consultees that would have to approve that. And I don't know where the evidence is that this would cause a highway safety, this is going to cause a highway safety issue to reduce on the speed limit on a 20. Again, on an A-class road, which is part of the primary route network nationwide, I don't think the evidence is there to get that through. I think the simplest thing, if you have concerns, could be to say no right turns for HGVs out of Cross Street and the applicant will have to deal with that if that's your big concern in terms of the safety at that junction. Thank you. Just to, just to mirror what Mark said actually, to be honest, I think the, if, if that's what you're minded to do, I think the right, the right way of doing it is through the traffic management plan rather than through the, uh, the, 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 the traffic regulation orders. The, traf the traffic regulation orders, as probably Mark has just described, is basically a different, different process, a different jurisdiction. Uh, and as a consequence, we can't control that. Committee can't control that because it's a consultation process and it's a different decision by other officers at Staffordshire County Council as Highways Authority. So there's even an argument that because it's a TRO, it's actually not even material to the application. But the right way of doing it, controlling that sort of thing, is through the traffic management uh, condition. Um, I was just going to respond to the second recommendation around the discharge of condition, which would be the traffic management plan. Um, so when we discharge a condition, what we normally do as officers, so the LPA receives the information, receives the plan, um, and we would then send it to County Council for their, because they're the experts in highways, highway safety, they would then make an assessment of that traffic management plan, and they would then give us comments, good or bad, and we would then obviously work with the applicant to get it right, so that the County Council are happy and have no objections uh, technically to that condition, and we would then as officers sign it off. So there isn't another process what we could do, though, is once we've got their approval, we can bring it back to committee to give you an update on what the traffic management plan looks like. But it would be for the technical consultee, statutory consultee, to, to be the ones who basically get involved and agree to the contents of that. But I think we've heard something today which is potentially an opportunity there to you know, put something in that uh, traffic management plan when it arrives. Councillor Smith? Yeah, hence the reason for saying to be brought back for review and feedback, really. I totally understand that in, in many instances, really, the, the legal arbitration is, is certainly not with us. Um, it's just, I don't think you quite realise that area, how dangerous it is. And a bit of a bizarre statement earlier saying that essentially a reduced speed could actually cause more problems. I, I, I don't really quite understand that. From my experience in that area, it's, it's an absolute um, bedlam of chaos. It can be at certain times. Uh, there's a lot of areas where pedestrians cross particularly dangerously. You've got a slant. Um, there's all sorts going on. And at the end of the day, when you look at the data, when you look at the crash map, 
information historically, many of the incidents, two of them very severe, by the way, on the A513, um, is, of of, is of concern. And, you know, if those heavy truck vehicles are going even 30 miles an hour, it's, it's a massive cause for concern. So I would, I would ask for it to be um, included if that is within the traffic management plan or is at least considered within the traffic management plan, um, then I would, uh, I would uh, urge that recommendation only to prevent the possibility of further injury um, or even potential deaths in that particular area. Thank you. Any more questions before we move to the discussion part of the debate? No? Nope. Any further comments to be made on this application this evening? Chair, I think we, uh, you know, we, we, we need to understand now. Um, clearly, uh, Councillor Councilor Smith has put forward a motion, and I think it was seconded by Councillor Turner. So, what we now what we now need to understand, uh, I think we, we we've had a good discussion about it. Whether uh, Councillor Smith uh, would want to withdraw the first part of your. Um, motion in the sense of um, part that deals with the TRO after after the discussion that we've had. Bring back to what you actually, to some extent, recommended a moment ago, which was to bring it as part of the second recommendation, bring the first slightly into the second recommendation. If it helps, I can read it out um, in terms of combining the two. So traffic management plan shall be submitted to and approved by the local planning authority. We know that. As such, I would recommend the traffic management plan should be brought to, uh, brought to the earliest to the planning committee for review um, with the potential to include the 20 mile an hour speed limit restrictions. Just at least a, a look at that um, for review and feedback by members. The difficulty being that the 20 mile, mile an hour zone would require a TRO, uh, Councillor Smith. That's the difficulty. Sorry. Um, I, I was just speaking to Debbie, who was saying that actually the, the discharge of condition information is also on our website. So it's not um, hidden from public view. So it can be viewed at any point and discussed with officers. It doesn't necessarily need a, a forum necessarily to bring it to so that's just an extra smith i think at this point we're sort of going in circles really so to be honest i'm quite happy for um the potential for a vote here uh, if members want to express either they agree or they don't want to agree i understand you don't have to necessarily follow through with it it's just a recommendation just to uh, reduce the potential um, for these sorts of incidents and to, at the very least, just bring it back just for comment and review because a large part of this um, of this whole process really is the traffic management plan. There's a lot of information and considering what we've already seen, um, and not to be rude, but from what we've seen already from the report so far and the lack of information at certain moments, there is a slight concern that if this um, traffic management plan is to be looked at internally and simply green-lighted through, um, I would be uh, concerned about that. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Obviously, we have you as moving that motion, Councillor Turner, to second that recommendation. Apologies. Um, anyone else? We move to the vote then. All those in favour of the recommendation by Councillor Smith? One. Two, one, two, two. All those against? Three, four, five, five. And any abstentions? One abstention. That recommendation is it's lost. Yeah, that recommendation, unfortunately, Councillor yeah. Smith has been defeated. Um, in that case, then, I presume we go move to, to go to substantive. Yeah. yeah. So. Substantive on that one, and then obviously 
going to take a vote. Yeah, take a vote on that one if that's yeah, okay. But, yeah. but if you'd have a second, yeah. proposal and seconder. Yeah. Mover. Okay, I'm looking for a mover and seconder. Councillor Smith and seconder. Councillor Pallet. We'll move to the vote. All those in favour? One, two, three, four, five. Any against? Two. Any abstentions? That is carried. Yes. Yeah. So in that case, then we are moving on to agenda item number five: <coughs> updates to committee from planning officers. I'd like to hand them back to Glen Baker Adam. Thank you, Chair. Um, probably the most significant update I can offer is the appeal for the police station redevelopment came through uh, last week. Um, members may recall this one, maybe some of members may not be part of that committee discussion, and in fact probably a large section of you weren't. This application was for the redevelopment of the police station on Spinning School Lane for 54 residential apartments. In December, this application was brought to committee, and we recommended approval for that application. However, as members at the time uh, overturned that recommendation due to a number of issues, and these include parking uh, provision, the shortfall in the housing mix, open space within the units and also the resident units themselves falling short of the uh, national space standards, so basically dictating the amount of space within them, um, consumer to the amount of bedrooms that they have. Um, so yeah, we had the appeal, I went to a hearing, um, I can't remember when that was actually, I think it was June, June, July time. Uh, in, in this very building. Um, so we had a good discussion about how officer officers could obviously support uh, members' decision on that. So we provided some evidence to the inspector that um, we believe to um, There we go, much better, sorry. Yes, so that application was, I say, overturned. So in effect, the inspectorate considered our arguments not to be strong enough, and then they recommended, oh, sorry, they gave a permission for the development. More crucially though, however, they also awarded full costs to the applicant on the appellant. Full details of the amount of that uh, cost award hasn't been received yet, but there could be um, a few thousand pounds uh, that we might need to pay for that. Obviously, we'll discuss that when that comes up for consideration. In effect, this means obviously we do have to pay their costs for the appeal. The inspectorate basically considered our reasons for refusals to be unreasonable, um, due to not having the evidence provided to them to obviously support our issues about parking standards and the other issues that we had at the time. Um, in the next committee, I will put this down more formally so we can actually see the decision. I can actually put a the app on the line so people can see what that decision says and also give a breakdown in terms of our response to that and how we go forward in terms of some lessons that we can learn. From the top of my head anyway, I can see two here. The first one is obviously we need to fully explore any reasons that we want to give in terms of how we you know, want to support any reasons for refusing an application. But ultimately, as well, we can look at deferring application when we do have these concerns, because ultimately, obviously, a committee has a better shelf life in terms of its time. Obviously, we don't want to spend too long on an application, whereas we can obviously defer an application if we do have concerns and maybe support our case a bit more stronger if we have the, if the time to do so. But as I say, I will bring this back in September. But I thought just as a headline, I'll give you that information now that we have got that cost towards coming to the council, which could obviously see us yeah, paying quite a substantial sum for an applicant, for an application that um, has come to the committee. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Glenn. Um, in that case, then, I'd like to thank all committee members, members of the public who've managed to stay with us this evening and those at home. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for watching. That concludes the business of this meeting, and I close the meeting at 19.